Hey, Breaking Points, Marshall here. There's been a lot of excellent reporting this week about how the Ukrainian Air Force, despite all the odds stacked against them, around a month into the conflict is still in the air, is still flying missions against Russian forces on the air and on the ground. So the question of how this is possible, how despite the lack of a no-fly zone, despite the new MiGs, and despite the vast quantifiable superiority of the Russian Air Force, this question of how they are still fighting in the air is an incredibly important one. So for this clip, I brought on Dr. Robert Farley of the University of Kentucky to discuss everything about the air war and Ukraine's air force. If you enjoy this clip, you can find the link to the full episode below in the Realignment YouTube channel as well, too. We're doing daily coverage of the conflict and know you all will get a kick out of it and find something really useful to learn about what's going on in the world. Hope you enjoy the clip. Why hasn't Russia achieved air superiority, given the nature of the fight they have? So that's a really good question. And it's so it's fascinating because every war game and every expectation um, that almost anybody ran before assumed that the Russians would have air dominance, uh, not just air superiority, but air supremacy. And those are two distinct terms, right? Air superiority means you have an advantage in the air. Air supremacy means you control the air. Um, and at this point, it's not even obvious that the Russians can, can consistently claim air superiority. Um, we anticipated that the Russians would do this like the Americans would do it, right? So we would identify every single surface to air missile system in the country and certainly every large and mobile one. Um, we would attack it with uh, what we call CAD, sur uh, uh, suppression of enemy air defense through drones, through manned aircraft, through standoff ranges. We would concentrate attacks on um, uh, Ukrainian airfields, right, on any visible uh, Ukrainian aircraft. We would hunt uh, every Ukrainian aircraft that we could find and that would be priority number one from you know literally the first minutes of the conflict. It would be the first thing that we would do. Um, and that's because we expect to have air supremacy and we expect to be able to do it. And we expect to meet effective uh, enemy surface to air missile systems and we have to destroy them. And we've practiced doing that since the, 19, since the 1960s, really. Um, the Russians haven't, right? For the Russians, their entire doctrine of how they use air power is different, right? I mean, they expected a completely different environment during uh, the Cold War if the war went hot, where they would lose lots of aircraft on the first day, some of them to SAMs, some of them to um, uh, enemy aircraft, but then they would overrun the bases, they would attack bases maybe with ballistic missiles, but basically the ground forces would, would, would you know, they would have to endure enemy air superiority for a bit, and then they wouldn't. Um, and Russian activity since then has largely been, you know, based around this. Like you, 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 you expect there'll be enemy SAMs, but you, you figure out how to deal with that until the ground forces get there. Um, you know, the Syrian rebels didn't have very much in the way of surface-to-air missiles. The Georgians did, and they shot down several aircraft. It wouldn't, that was really embarrassing for the Russians. Um, and so the Russians really lack this giant surface or this suppression of enemy air defense capability that the United States and other Western countries have you know, labored to build over the past 30 years and they use so effectively in Libya and in Iraq and in Iraq again, um, or Serbia, right? Where we just really, we have built into our capabilities that we will clear not only the skies, but we'll also clear um, the ground of stuff that can kill our airplanes. And the Russians don't have that. They just don't have that. Um, and so they, they can't fly lots of airplanes into Ukrainian airspace because they're, they're worried about losing those airplanes and they're expensive. And this is interesting because as you just pointed out then, so much of Russian strategic thinking in the air sense is rooted in the Cold War. But, and this is pure conventional wisdom in the space, but so much of post Cold War military thinking has been rooted in the in the uh, in Desert Storm in Iraq in 1991. So why haven't the why wouldn't the Russians say, "Hey, we are the United States in this case. Ukraine is Iraq in the sense that they have a modern military. Iraq had you know one of the biggest tank armies in the world. They have a modern military, but end of the day." we can do these very specific things to finish this up quickly. You know, the Russians wanted to get Kiev by, you know, three or four days in. So I, I, I just don't understand like why they wouldn't, why they would maintain that Cold War mentality in the face of this. 
Well, so it's a huge investment, right? So the United States began sort of taking note of problems of how to deal with enemy SAMs in the 1960s when we were having our planes shot down over Vietnam, mm-hmm. right? So that creates this, this community within the Air Force and the Navy. It's called the wild, first called the wild weasels, where basically it's like we identify enemy surface or enemy uh, SAM networks and we destroy them. Um, there's a great book uh, by a fighter pilot named Dan Hampton. It's, at F- F- it's called Viper Pilot. He flew F-16s in the wild weasel role. Um, and, you know, he's a fighter pilot, so he boasts a lot. But basically, he makes the argument that, you know, the, this is the most elite profession among fighter pilots, is hunting down enemy missile networks. Um, you know, again, up until 1991, this just wasn't a priority for the Russians, because they didn't think that it was going to be a big deal um, for having to do it. And then after 1991, you have the complete decapitalization of uh, Russian military capabilities. So they're not flying very much. They can't really come up with, they don't have the money to research or to buy new kinds of weapon systems. Um, The pilots don't fly enough hours to really develop an expertise on how to fight against enemy SAM systems. Um, And so they just, they uh, never really have the opportunity to build up this capability. Now, I think that for Russia's next war, certain, probably suppression of enemy air defense is going to be a big deal. But but for this one, um, you know, it's it's hot, especially with the degree to which the United States and NATO are flooding Ukraine with new surface air missile systems. Um, it's hard to see the Russian air forces really having a decisive effect or learning how to deal with those in this particular conflict. So, can you talk about the? surface to air missile aspect here. So what what are the Russians facing from the ground? You made the point that there's a difference between stationary and mobile targets. So what does the picture look like if you're looking at Ukraine, if you're Russian right now? Right. So I, I wish I had a better handle of the equipment, but I'll give the general classes. So, you know, generally speaking, uh, you're going to have big systems like, say, an S-300 that, or an S-300 and S-400 that um, is going to cover a huge amount of airspace. I think for the S-400, which is the best of the best, it's better than American equipment. Um, you know, you can you can track dozens of targets at 400 up to 400 miles away. Um, S-300 is kind of like that, only less, but you can shoot down stuff that's that's a really long ways away. Which I'm going to go back and hobby horse this is another reason why a no-fly zone is a problem because a Russian surface air missile system can be in Russia a hundred miles inside the border and it can still kill an American fighter. Um, what do you do about that in the context of an NFC? Um, and then you have medium range systems that are more like the buck, um, which uh, is the one that shot down the, uh, you, the Malaysian jetliner back in 2014. Um, and these are lethal systems that will basically cover areas and they'll be able to shoot down um, uh, planes operating uh, at a fairly substantial altitudes, more than just helicopters that are attacking your stuff. Um, and then, and this is what's really flooding the uh, Ukraine right now, is man pads and other small mobile uh, SAMs. And these are, um, you know, based on individuals. And these are great for killing um, really flow, lo- 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 really low flying um, fixed wing aircraft. And sometimes those fixed wing aircraft have to fly low because they feel a threat from the medium range or the long range systems, and so they fly into the teeth of the portable systems. Um, uh, but are also really effective against helicopters. Um, and so that's the kind of increasingly spiky and bristly Ukrainian air defense that we're seeing. And it's not obvious at this point that the Russians have done very much even to degrade what the Ukrainians had on day one, um, as opposed to what they have now. But this is also you know, why the Ukrainians themselves are flying fairly limited sorties because the Russians are, they have their big uh, uh, long range systems in Russia, but they're also moving mobile systems into Ukraine. Um, And so Ukrainian pilots are justly more afraid of the Russian surface air missile systems than they are of the Russian fighters. Yeah. And to to that point, as I understand it, one of Ukraine's top fighter pilots was actually killed very early in the war by, this was the longest ever recorded um, kill by, uh, I think it was by the S-400 um, in, in terms of, um, I'm not, not even sure it was from within the country. So that, that goes to that point. So let's talk about what can and what is the Ukrainian Air Force doing? So for example, the New York Times article cites 10 sorties a day 
uh, on a good day from the Ukrainians. Um, there was this big discourse for a while, a few weeks ago around, there's this 40 mile convoy um, and a convoy, attacking a convoy in an air, you know, in an air to ground role is different than air to air combat in the missile sense. So are the Ukrainians mostly focused on air to air fighting? Are they focused on the air to ground role? Um, and we need to get into the the drones, especially the Bayaktar, in a second. But what how, what is the Ukrainian what is the Ukrainian MiG twenty nine or um, Su twenty seven doing right now? So, to my understanding, and I don't know what we have yet in terms of a breakdown between air to air kills versus surface to air kills. Um, but to my understanding, uh, most of the Ukrainian missions right now are air to ground. Right there, there they are attacking, you know, visible concentrations of Russians, especially visible concentrations of Russians where there doesn't appear to be any surface to air missile systems. Um, I think that they are also flying just to be a fleet in being, right, so that the uh, the Russians know are fully aware of their presence and know that it's dangerous to. Uh, fly aircraft or even helicopters um, into uh, the area. I mean, the thing about the thing about fighter jocks is that in every single war, they managed to kill 300% of the entire uh, enemy air force because they never really supply accurate data um, with respect to how many planes they shoot down. Um, so we're probably gonna have to wait until the end of the war to find out uh, if the Ukrainians Air Force is having anything in terms of air-to-air -air effectiveness. Um, but to my understanding, you're looking mostly at uh, air-to-ground stuff, which all of these planes are capable of doing to, to greater or lesser effect, um, which are you know basically against Russian armored vehicles and Russian armored convoys. And they've, they've certainly lost some aircraft in this role. So they have the Su-25 Frogfoot NATO designation, which is basically the Russian equivalent of an A-10. Um, and they've lost several of the, those in this conflict. And let's talk about the drone side of this, because this is because the, so for example, the, the Ukrainians are fielding the Bayaktar, which is a really cheap um, drone alternative um, that people were really skeptical of before, but to the point from analysts, because Russia doesn't have air superiority, this slow moving drone has actually been quite effective. So can you speak to how the drone side of this conflict has looked? Yeah, so I mean, the Ukrainians and the Russians are using lots of drones, but the Ukrainians seem to be using them more effectively. Um, you know, one of the biggest things drones do, and this is any kind of really light drones, just provide reconnaissance, provide information and data for uh, the fielded forces, right? So that they know what's behind the enemy lines, they know who's moving and so forth. And so that's the first thing that your drone is, the first and really the most important thing that your drone is going to get for you. Um, now, the Bioptar does that, and that's a hugely important part of its role. But it also carries four laser guided bombs. Um, and so uh, it can not only reconnoiter uh, an enemy target, it can also attack that target. And what makes it so effective is that on the one hand, it's pretty cheap. So you don't, you're not overly worried about losing them. And the Turks are just, you know, they just want to make the factory go burnt um, mm -hmm. and sell more of these things. And they're probably going to sell them all over Europe. Um, I hope people, real quick, I hope, I hope people get the meme reference you're making there. <laughs> it, won't, it probably won't translate over audio. But e -R 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 -T, <laughs> no. anyway, So um, their advantage is that they fly um, just above the useful range of anti-aircraft artillery and the useful range of man pads. Um, they are really small, so their radar cross section, they're made of, they have composite material. So they're not quite stealthy, but they're just hard to see. Um, if that if that makes uh, any sense, um, and they're so small and they're so inexpensive that in some cases, you know, to shoot one of these down with an S four hundred, your, your air to air missile might cost more than the airplane you're shooting down, um, and so it's not and you're not you're not guaranteed of a hit because they're so small. Um, that they may avoid, the, the missile may not lock on or something else may go wrong. And you're, so you're wasting, you're, you're throwing away your shot um, by shooting at one of these things rather than uh, sort of a big manned fighter. Um, and so they're not, they're not completely immune to enemy fire, but they can, they can fly over uh, the lines and then they can hit things with their bombs um, from relative impunity. Um, and they've done that in uh, Libya, they've done that in Ethiopia, they've done that in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, and they're doing it in uh, Ukraine. So for the last two questions before we get to battleships to wrap this, one, a lot of just common discourse has been real surprise at the decrepitude of the Russian army specifically. So the armed forces on the ground, the anecdote everyone talks about is like the, the, the rotting tires. Um, and a, an example of just something that just is inconceivable to a Western 
Chinese, any modern military, this is kind of incredible. What is the assessment of the Russian Air Force's uh, performance and its state, given what the wisdom was around before the conflict started? So, I mean, there's a, you know, one of the biggest questions we've had, again, is like, why hasn't the Russian Air Force been doing anything? And, you know, you can answer that question halfway with, well, there just there are just operational realities here, which are really difficult for the Russians to, to deal with. Um, but I think, and uh, Justin Bronk uh, at RUSI is a great guy to follow on this. Uh, Michael Kaufman at CNA is wonderful for all questions Russian. Um, but, uh, you know, part of the answer seems to be their readiness rates don't really seem to be that high. Um, the uh, the weather uh, is a problem, right? They don't have the kind of all weather capability that uh, the U.S. Air Force had again spent decades honing. And the the weather over Ukraine in March and February is bad, um, and so they don't have sort of all the sensor packages that allow them to attack. Um, you know, we know that their fi- their flyers, their pilots get fewer hours in the cockpit, but on the other hand, you know, they've been bombing the bejesus out of Syria for a while now. Um, and so you would have expected that they would gain some uh, some experience out of that. But again, that's experience in a completely permissive uh, uh, in a completely permissive air environment where they don't have to worry about enemy fighters and they don't have to worry about um, really they don't have to worry about surface to air missile systems. So you know they're being asked to do something that they're they're not really trained to do and they don't necessarily even have the equipment to do. Um, and so we don't, we don't the, the question of the corruption and the readiness rates and that sort of stuff, we just don't know, right? And I don't think we're going to know until we have sort of a much clearer picture into how the Russian military machine functions here.